Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti the Jamal Priyars. And this is a reading of the 20th chapter titled A Civil Ceremony. Preceptors must be more than intelligent. They must be super intelligent. They must also be married. For according to Tantric injunction, only a married person can be the guru of married people. In late March 1959, a DMC program was held in the Bihar village of Araha, home to Acharya's Deep Narayan and Natkat Kedar. Baba arrived on the morning of the 27th at Mitai Station in Saharsa. The Margis received him with ringing blasts from conch shells and a raucous kirtan backed by a flute and drum ensemble while a host of curious onlookers crowded the platform. Outside the station, a parade of elephants was waiting. Baba and Pranay mounted the lead elephant with the help of a bamboo staircase and a huge procession set out for Araha, four kilometers distant. Bindeshwari, Nagina, and others from Baba's party rode the remaining elephants. The rest of the Margis traveled by bullock cart or jeep, or else ran and danced alongside the lumbering beasts. The band followed, and Margis continued singing at the top of their lungs the entire way. Cows, goats, and other animals joined in. At one point, Bindeshwari went into trance and would have fallen off his elephant had Nagina not caught him. The route was lined with villagers who could hear the procession approaching well before they caught sight of it. A number of them, assuming they were watching a marriage procession, commented on how handsome the groom looked. When the procession arrived in Araha, Natkat Kedar led Baba's elephant up to the newly constructed Jagrati, a traditional village structure with earthen walls and a thatch roof. Baba climbed down the bamboo staircase, and as he walked up to the veranda, the women threw parched rice on the path in front of him, waved lamps, and sang devotional songs, all in keeping with the local tradition. Baba cut the long ribbon of mango leaves that ran across the entrance and stepped onto the veranda where Deep Narayan's wife, Jiva Cha Devi, was waiting to perform the traditional arati. She lifted a silver plate laden with burning camphor and incense and began tracing slow, solemn circles in front of Baba, while everyone chanted in unison the arati verse. Then Baba entered the Jagrati, which had been prepared as his residence for the three-day program. That afternoon, a commotion arose in a large tent that had been set up a couple of days earlier near the Jagrati. Members of the Rabnath Society, a fundamentalist Hindu group, started shouting anti-Ananda Marga slogans through a cheap loudspeaker. They hurled insults at Baba and the Margis alleging that Ananda Marga violated the Hindu scriptures because it asked Brahmins to remove their sacred thread, spoke out against idol worship, and allowed women to attend programs alongside men. They were led by a renowned Hindu scholar from Benares, Bayankar Acharya Shastri. When Baba heard the commotion, he came out of his room and asked the Margis what was going on. When they told him, he smiled and nodded his head. Don't worry, he said. The more they shout on the Marga, the more they do publicity for us. The next morning, Bayankar Acharya issued a written statement challenging Ananda Murti to a scriptural debate. A group of Margis brought the challenge to Baba. Many of them were angry at the ongoing insults coming from the Ramnath tent and were restless to take some kind of action. Baba listened and said, This kind of debate is for followers of the same scripture. Since we do not accept the Vedas 
or the Gita as proof, there is no question of a scriptural debate. But since they have invited us, we can extend on the courtesy of attending. Indradev Gupta and Chandranath will be our representatives. Baba, Indradev said, Bayankar is insisting that the debate be conducted in Sanskrit. Chandranath and I are both very weak in Sanskrit. What should we do? Don't worry, Baba replied. Tell him it should be in French, and then scold him in French for two minutes. Then Baba reached out and touched Indradev at his trikuti. The debate was fixed for midday. By the time the noon hour struck, more than a thousand people were sitting on the grass in front of the Ramnath tent. Baba was watching from the window of his room in the Jagrati. The four local pundits, who had been selected to serve as judges, sat on chairs to one side. Bayankaracharya, Indradev, and Chandranath stood and faced the audience. As expected, Bayankar opened by insisting that the debate be held in Sanskrit, the language of religious scholarship. Indradev immediately held up his hand. I object. The debate should rightly be in Hindi. Otherwise, no one in the audience will understand. Only the judges and one or two others will be able to follow the discussion. If you don't know Sanskrit, then why do you have Sanskrit verses in your books? Bayankar shouted. Remove them from your books or else debate in Sanskrit. Indradev looked back at Baba, who nodded from his window. Then he turned his attention back to Bayankar. You want the debate to be in Sanskrit so you can befool the people. It might as well be in French then. Indradev followed with a long string of epithets in French. Though no one could understand what he was saying, everyone in the audience laughed, even the pundits. When the laughter died down, however, the pundits agreed with Bayankar that the debate should be held in Sanskrit. Bayankar began the debate. He put a question to Indradev that concerned grammar and its role in the establishment of a proof. Though Indradev's Sanskrit was rather sketchy, he understood the question. Fortunately, it was a subject with which he was familiar. After pointing out that the question had nothing to do with the topic of the debate, he answered it in Sanskrit in half the allotted ten minutes, and then used the remaining five minutes to repeat the same thing in Hindi. He not only gave the correct answer, but also pointed out several grammatical errors in Bayankar's framing of the question. The crowd applauded, and the smiles on many other faces gave Indradev confidence that he would be able to win them over to his side. When the applause died down, one of the judges announced that the debate would now continue in Hindi. They had only wanted to make sure that Indradev knew Sanskrit. As the debate progressed, Bayankar raised questions about the sacred thread, the caste system, and the equal rights of women to perform spiritual practices. Indradev, with Chandranath's help, answered each question with patience and logic. As he continued to win over the crowd, his opponent began losing his patience, often interrupting the Margis while they were speaking. At 4.30, Bayankar insisted that it was too late to continue. Indradev and Chandranath were declared the winners by the judges, to the enthusiastic applause of the audience. Afterward, many of the villagers stayed behind to congratulate the speakers. They would remember Indradev especially with respect for years to come. When the crowd finally dispersed, Indradev and Chandranath went to Baba for his blessing. Baba put his hand on Indradev's shoulder and said, Indradev, very good, very good. I didn't know you spoke Sanskrit so well. Indradev laughed. Neither did I, Baba. That was only your grace. You see, Indradev, they wanted to debate me, but my disciple defeated them. It was a good lesson for them. Late that night, Bayankaracharya sat on Indradev and congratulated him for how well he spoke Sanskrit. 
He apologized for any inconvenience he might have caused. I have no fight with you or the Margis, he said. The Rabnath Society paid me 500 rupees to come here and oppose an Andamarga. It was just a job. Now that it's over, I'll be leaving in the morning. After that, the only commotion in the village was the devotional exuberance of the Margis. The next morning, at the Margis' request, Baba visited each of their houses while the rest of the devotees followed behind. In each house, he sampled something from the plates of food the Margi women brought out for him. And as he walked through the village, the non-Margi women also came out from their homes with plates of dried fruit and nuts to offer him. At the house of Natkat Kedar, Natkat's wife became so lost in her devotional feelings that she washed Bava's feet in milk without realizing it, instead of the sandal water that she had prepared. The morning after the DMC, the Margis took Baba back to Mitai Station by car. The entire village lined both sides of the street to wish Baba farewell. Many of them accompanied the Margis to the station, singing and dancing as they went. In the meanwhile, unbeknownst to the Margis, Baba's family was busy making arrangements for Baba's marriage. Baba's mother had decided that her son's marriage was long overdue. Now that she was getting on in years, preparing to turn 60 without another female in the house, she needed a daughter-in-law to help her with her domestic responsibilities. Baba has shown no interest in the idea whatsoever, but over time, Abarani gradually increased the pressure on her son, and eventually he agreed. She deputed Hiraprabha, then raising her children as a widow in Chinchura, to search for a suitable bride. Early in the year, Hiraprabha entered into negotiations with the family of a postal department superintendent from the city of Bandel, 48 kilometers to the north of Calcutta, who had been searching for a husband for their 20-year-old daughter, Uma Devi Dutta. Shortly after the Araha DMC, an agreement was reached between the two families. Typical and tradition Indian society at that time, where arranged marriages were still the norm. Hiraprabha explained to them that her brother would not accept a religious ceremony or any of the pomp and circumstance generally associated with an Indian marriage. A simple civil ceremony would have to do, and the family agreed. While the negotiations were going on, Baba said nothing to the Margis, or practically nothing. One day, Pranay was reviewing organizational matters with Baba, when Baba said, Pranay, your mother wants to meet me. Pranay was confused. His mother, an initiated Margi, lived with him and got to see Baba on a regular basis. He wondered if there was some obscure spiritual significance to Baba's comment, but he didn't ask. A couple of days later, Beidinath Ray told Pranay that he had a stunning secret to divulge. Baba was going to get married. The family of the bride had made discreet inquiries in the workshop about the groom's character, salary, and so forth, standard in an Indian marriage negotiation, and the inquiries had come to his department. In fact, he had learned that Baba was scheduled to catch the overnight train to Haura that very night. Pranay was stunned. But then he remembered Baba's earlier comment. What had been an incomprehensible remark suddenly made sense. Pranay told Bedinath that he knew nothing about it, but he intended to find out. Without wasting any time, he went directly to Baba's house and entered straight into Baba's room without requesting permission, as he was wont to do at times. He found Baba packing his suitcase. Baba informed him nonchalantly that he was going to Chinchura for a few days. Pranay made a pretext of discussing some organizational matter. While Baba's back was turned, 
he took a quick look in the suitcase. He saw some silken shirts, a bottle of aftershave, and a red card that looked suspiciously like a marriage invitation. There was nothing in Baba's behavior that indicated anything out of the ordinary, nor did Pranay ask, but he had his confirmation. As soon as he left Baba's house, he started passing the word among the Margis that Guru Deva was getting married. The news sent shockwaves through the Margi community in Jamalpur and beyond. As the Margis there started sending the news to Margis in other places, many did not believe it could be true. They had always assumed that Baba would remain unmarried, a sannyasi in spirit if not in dress, as was the practice with the vast majority of spiritual gurus in India. For some, it was a blow to their faith. How could their spiritual master be married or have family relations with a woman? Some of them came to Pranay to express their disbelief and confusion. Even Dasarath felt some reaction. He considered it strange indeed that Gurudeva would give his consent to such an arrangement. But Pranay scolded him and the others who came to see him. What of it, he said. Marriage is a perfectly natural affair. Sooner or later, everyone gets married. Why should Gurudeva not lead a natural life? He called to their attention to the first edition of Charya Charya, in which Baba had written, Marriage is not a hindrance to Dharma Sadhana. Marriage is a Dharmika ceremony. No disciple should harbor any inferiority complex about being married. And for this very purpose, every disciple should consider that the Guru of the Marga is married. Baba had always emphasized this to his married disciples, Pranay pointed out. So why should they feel strange now when he was about to turn his teaching into a concrete reality? Baba would later point out in a discourse on Tantra that one of the characteristics of the Tantric Guru is that he must be married in order to set a proper example for his householder disciples, that illumination is equally accessible to all, regardless of whether one is a monk or married. When Baba arrived in Chinchura, he met his first cousin, Ajit Biswas, who accompanied him to the bride's house and then on to the civil register for the marriage ceremony, along with Hiraprava's family and the family of the bride. Hiraprava's brother-in-law, served as the best man. It was the first time the bride and groom had met. After the wedding, Ajit informed Baba that the family had scheduled a traditional ceremony for the next day, one in which Baba would have to dress up in the traditional groom's costume, similar to a prince's garb from ancient times. Baba objected. He pointed out that he had insisted on an unostentatious, non-religious ceremony, Ajit laughed. Bubuda, you are caught by your own words. This is a purely social ceremony. It has no religious background. Baba gave in, and the bride's family was happy to have a little pomp and circumstance after the rapid and rather austere ceremony at the register's office. Back in Jamalpur, Pranay was able to find out which train Baba was returning by. An easy matter for a railway workshop employee. He, Chandranath, Ramaswarath, and some 50 other Margis met the train in Bagalpur. Pranay, Chandranath, and a few of the senior most disciples made their way to Baba's compartment to pay their respects and salute the marriage party. In the compartment, they saw a young woman sitting opposite Baba, her head and face veiled by the fold of her sari. As they paid their respects to their guru, it was clear to them that Uma Devi found it all very strange and very unexpected. In fact, she had no idea that she had married a spiritual guru. All she knew about Baba was that he was an accounts clerk in the Jamalpur workshop and very well behaved. Ramaswarath was standing outside the compartment. 
he had taken initiation about a year earlier from Acharya Sarangi, his supervisor in the Barishwar Block Development Office. Still beset by doubts about his guru getting married, Ramaswarath wondered, as he looked at Baba, if Baba might perhaps now lose his spiritual powers. Suddenly, he felt a powerful vibration running through his spinal column. A wave of ecstasy overcame him that would take him many days to evade. His body shook, and Chandranath had to physically hold him up to keep him from falling. All his doubts vanished. After Baba and his new bride arrived in Jamalpur, Pranay requested and received permission from Baba to hold the wedding reception for the Margis. A separate reception was held for family members. He asked Baba how his wife should be addressed, and Baba told him that she should be called Margamata. Pranay prepared an invitation card in the name of Marga Gurudeva and Margamata and sent it out to all the Margis. Baba acted as host during the reception, which was held in the courtyard of the Jagrati. Some of the Margis straight away accepted Uma Devi as one with the Master, following a centuries-old custom, and did Sastang Pranam before her at the beginning of the reception. Others, less sure how she should be treated, simply did Namaskar and took their seats. Baba sat on a specially decorated dais alongside Uma Devi while people took photos. Both he and Uma Devi gave short talks. Then Baba listened while his wife, who was a skilled instrumentalist, gave a sitar recital. Afterward, he walked around and made sure that everyone was satisfied with the food, asking the guests one by one if they needed anything. After the reception, life returned to normal in the Sarkar house. There were now five adults in the small two-bedroom quarters where Baba lived with his mother and his younger brothers, Sudanchu and Manas, a rather congested living arrangement for a man who by this time had thousands of disciples, but entirely characteristic of Baba with his love of simplicity especially in the world's second most populous country, where such an arrangement might be considered comfortable. Uma Devi took over most of the domestic chores and was not seen much by the Margis, at least in the beginning. Sudanchu, with the lifelong devotion he showed his brother, now took on the added responsibility of looking after Uma Devi's material needs. He brought home Baba's monthly pay and gave it to his mother, along with his own. Abarani, in turn, gave Baba five rupees a month for pocket expenses, as she had been doing, and two rupees to Uma Devi. Baba's brother, Himanchu, who would visit on weekends and holidays, later wrote that while for the rest of the family there was noticeable change after Uma Devi came to live with them, they can see no change whatsoever in Baba. He followed the exact same routine as before, leaving and returning from the office, with such punctuality that you could set your watch by it, going for field walk, darshan and DMC, and maintaining his personal time for sadhana. He offered no outward hint that anything had changed in his life. There was one point, however, concerning his wife, in which Baba left no ambiguity. Not long after the marriage, some of the Margis went to Pranay and asked him to convey their request to Baba that Margamata share the stage with him during DMC. For them it was a matter of showing the ultimate respect to the Guru's wife, in keeping with traditions passed down from their forefathers. Baba's reply was short and sharp. In DMC, Anandamurti is a singular entity. There is no place for any second entity. The matter was never brought up again. Baba did give permission for her to address the Margis when he was not present on the stage. After that, from time to time, Pranay will arrange for Uma Devi to give a short talk at some point during the DMC program. 
He remembered her as being a quiet, simple Bengali housewife at the time, somewhat overwhelmed by the turn of events that saw her married to an increasingly popular and controversial spiritual master. In fact, the first few times he asked her to give a talk, he had to coach her beforehand on what to say. The time would come, however, when Uma Devi would feel ready to give spiritual talks of her own, with consequences that none of the Margis at that time could possibly foresee. Thank you.